Hello, and welcome to this session. My name is Freddy Lilbert. I'm co-chairing this session. I'm from Copenhagen EMS. Uh, and I would like to introduce also my co-chair, Joyce, please. Hi, my name is Joyce. I'm a critical care um, um, consultant and I work in Warwick in the United Kingdom. Thank you. And we're sitting, I'm sitting here in wonderful Copenhagen, as you can see in my background, Joyce is, is sitting in UK. And we, but we would rather be in Manchester with all of you uh, if it wasn't for COVID, but we are all sitting in different places. Uh, but I anyhow would like to welcome you to the one of the final session for this ERC 2020 virtual conference. I believe it, we have been a bit of curious and also excited and concerned about how a virtual congress would actually take place with the topic of resuscitation, but I think it worked out well. Um, though we have been missing being together, uh, we miss the face to face networking, however, COVID pandemic. It is the right thing to do in the COVID pandemic right now. This is the only responsible way to continue doing what we should do, sharing our knowledge and improve survival. So take care. Uh, COVID-19 has affected all of us, even sport, which this session is about. And who would believe that we should have football without live audience? I wouldn't believe that, uh, but that's the case now. Sport is important for our health, uh, physical health, mental health, and it will continue to be so despite COVID. Sport, sport is also an excellent field of play to make public awareness about cardiac arrest, as Sanja uh, mentioned in his talk. And this talk is about epidemiology of cardiac arrest in sport, about prevention, which is a very important, and field of play. These three themes and topics we will uh, address in this session. Um, and I'll go to the first speaker. We have three distinguished speakers, international speakers who know all about this. And I'll introduce Laurie Morrison. Uh, she was the, uh, from Canada. Uh, I like the picture behind you. Uh, I would really like to go to Canada. It's a lovely country with a lovely nature. Um, and you were the first author, or you were one of the authors for the first ever publication in New England Journal of Medicine documenting uh, the incidence of cardiac arrest in sport. Uh, I really enjoyed your presentation, so nicely presented, and for the audience not to be native speakers, it was excellent. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, but I'll give the word to you, and you will give a short summary of your presentation, and afterwards we'll take questions from the audience. So already now start, please, put in questions. Thanks very much, Freddie and Joyce, and uh, it's certainly an honor to be here. It's been a great conference virtually, and uh, kudos to the ERC for such courage. Um, it's an honor to be on this panel with Sanjay and David, and I'll do my best to quickly summarize in, I think I have three, four slides. Uh, first slide, please. This was my summary slide on incidents. This is the data from the New England paper, uh, which shows that athlete, the incidence of athletic, uh, out of hospital cardiac arrest in athletes is 0.76. And I compared it with a publication in resuscitation in 2018 for maternal cardiac arrest, showing that maternal cardiac arrest, which is considered by most of us to be incredibly rare, is actually more common than um, cardiac arrest in sport. And when you compare it against our age specific incidents, you can see um, that in the same age group uh, for patient years, the incidence is 4.84 for athletes in uh, possible cardiac arrest compared to 20.18 for women in childbearing age. Next slide. Outcomes are fascinating because you can see the cardiac arrest survival rate with athletes and out of hospital cardiac arrest is enormously high at 43.8. And um, the survival in the comparative age group falls to 8.6. In maternal cardiac arrest, it's not as high at 16.7, um, but the, uh, neither is the survival in that particular age group at 6.8. I just wanted to show the remarkable neonatal survival because for any of us who in our career have had the misfortune to have to participate in maternal cardiac arrest resuscitation, 
it's, oh, I think we all have this feeling that the neonates don't survive, but in fact, they have a very high survival rate. Next slide. And finally, the summary slide on pre-screening. Um, they, in, in essence, there were very few cardiac etiologies in this extremely large data set that was published. Um, in um, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, there were only two patients in the competitive athlete group and only four patients in the non-competitive athlete group. But in terms of structural heart disease, there was no, no patient, or no one had it in the competitive group and only four patients in the non-competitive. So the summary for the population, which was served by this paper was a population of 6.8 million people. We would have had to screen 146,000 athletes to just find one with a risk of SCA. And more importantly, looking at the incidence of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy in this same regional population, we would have disqualified 760 players. And next slide. And I did in the presentation, I compared it against, there's a great uh, publication in JAHA looking at the same age group in etiology. And even in the non-athletes, the etiology of uh, cardiac etiology is fairly rare in this age group on or off the field of play. Thank you. Thank you very much, Laurie. Uh, then we will go to questions from the audience. George, do you didn't know if we have any questions there coming up? It doesn't seem so right now, uh, but then I would like to ask you a question, uh, Laurie. Um, the, my first question is actually in your, I saw in your presentation uh, and I, I, I suffered with you on your self-isolation, but you come out of, came out of your self-isolation for COVID, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> I would like to hear more about that, but that's not in this session. But my question is about screening on the um, you, 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 you comment on that in your presentation and have pros and cons and give some figures that I have seen for the first time at least. Uh, please, could you comment and give your thoughts on, on this kind of controversial discussion? Is it worthwhile? Mm -hmm. So I think based on what we see in the autophosphate cardiac arrest uh, data, that it is it's not worthwhile. And I worry that there's so many impediments to children participating in sport. I don't want to give any more reason why not to participate in sport. I do think that the survival rate is so high in this age group. It's one out of two will survive because they're healthy for the most part. And um, and I, and I would rather put the I'd rather put the effort into community support um, so that we have AEDs and the right response. And um, I'd rather just encourage people to do sport. I think there was another question that came up. Yeah, and that's a poll coming coming up. As well, so please answer the, that to that. George, do we want to take the questions from the audience, please? Yep, uh, of course. So just look at the um, questions. Um, mm -hmm. One of the questions is about um, the, whether pre screening would be beneficial uh, due to the number of athletes being disqualified under the age of 24. Um, do you think pre-screening or if there's a screening program, it should depend on the background and the age of the person uh, or the population you're going to be targeting? Right, this, this the paper um, looked at 350,000 athletes uh, that's were in the, in the region of uh, the cardiac arrest data set that we were looking at, the 6.7 million people. There were 350,000 competitive athletes between the age of 12 and 45. So it, it's a pretty diverse background and it's a huge data set. So I think uh, from a generalizability, I, I think there's generalizability across most populations, but I do agree with one of the questions that if your country, if your region 
um, um, had a very high propensity of a certain disease, uh, which was not generalizable to this data set that we used in Canada, then I would agree that it may be different and you should look at your own cardiac arrest data set to make those kind of recommendations. Thank you, Laurie. Um, and there's another question. This is an interesting question uh, from Stefan saying about illegal drugs and whether the use of testosterone and other drugs or abuse might be of concern. Yes. So in that paper in JAHA, first author is Alan. Um, that actually does tease it out beautifully. In When we often look at pre-hospital cardiac arrest data sets, we end up with this bucket called presumed cardiac. And in the presumed cardiac bucket, we assume they're all cardiac. But in that particular paper, she drills down and, um, and finds out that, in fact, it is there's illicit drugs and a lot of mental health and mental health drugs that are contributing to that presumed cardiac etiology. And very little cardiac in this same age group. Actually, she expands the age group in her paper. She goes from 2 to 45. And in the New England paper on sport, it's 12 to 45. But it's, it's dramatic how little true cardiac um, causes for the etiology. That's really interesting. Thank you very much for that. Um, and uh, we've been sending out some poll questions. I've just seen that there's one live now about whether there's a maternal cardiac arrest response team set up to support your ED. Um, so I've responded to this um, uh, uh, poll question and um, it's quite interesting. I'm not sure whether um, uh, anyone's uh, participated, but I encourage you to, to go on there and just um, uh, for us to find out what everyone's um, uh, from different countries, what the practice might be. It just makes an interesting read at the end. Um, right. Uh, okay. There's another question about what kind of sports might be more dangerous. Um, from your reading mm -hmm. of the papers that you looked at, were there any particular kind of sports? Is it football or is it... Um, other sports. It's the running sports. So um, in my talk, um, uh, maybe three quarters of the way down, there's a slide that, because I always get asked that question about, well, which sport is it? And so it's the running sports are number one. And then, um, and that also includes a hockey, both ice and uh, field hockey, uh, not fields, right? Ice and uh, ball hockey. And, um, and then second, a close second behind is basketball and soccer is right behind. Right. So perhaps it's not um, so much the, the type of sports, but um, sort of uh, the duration, maybe the exertion, um, mm -hmm. that uh, yeah. the amount of exertion they have to, uh, how intense the exercise actually is. Right. And, and in, in this, in, um, in a few of the papers, they do it by metabolic equivalence, um, which is interesting. And so it's, it's three metabolic equivalents is the comparator across all sport. Right. No, that's really interesting. Um, a lot of um, questions are coming in right now. So there's another one here does excluding, it's from James Nicholson, that it does excluding at risk in individuals uh, from sport consider the consequential negative effect, meaning worse than cardiovascular and mental health. So when you're, right. when you're trying to combine the actual risk of sports, does that exclude this? Does excluding risk individuals from sport, and just reading the question to make sure, consider the consequential negative effects, right? So based on our data, we would not pre-screen and exclude people from sport, uh, just because the incidence of having a cardiac arrest during sport was so low. And for all the reasons that I think James Nicholson has asked the question, it, uh, in our population, we would have excluded if you just took out the hypertrophic uh, cardiomyopathies. That was a lot of people who couldn't have done sport, who were doing sport in a very safe way. So based on our data in our population in Canada, we wouldn't recommend it. And I agree with James Nicholson that there is negative sequelae uh, by being ostracized or on, um, inhibited from participating. Robert, 
Tina. Uh, yeah, Tina is asking another question. Children, children with heart diseases, are there any reasons why to restrict them to sport in general or competitive sport as well? Um, just uh, there's, there's an initiative in Denmark where there will be some uh, sport clubs for uh, children with heart disease, even severe heart disease, and it seems to be very popular. So this is a question that re relates to that. I know it's oh, yeah. not about professional sports, but it's sport yeah. for, for lay person, anyone. Yes, and in our data, the competitive athletes were small. It's the non-competitive, which I think is where Tino is going yeah. here. And we looked at all those non-competitive and there were very few, I showed the screen, that there were eight, four with structural heart disease and four with cardiomyopathy, uh, four with cardiomyopathy. So, you know, Tina, we would, based on our data, we would encourage these kind of programs because the, the downside is so, so rare. And the upside, again, as Dr. Nicholson said in his question, the upside is so positive. So, Joyce, do we have more time for questions or should we leave it for, for, the, for Laurie and others to answer the questions afterwards? Because there's a lot of questions coming in. It's a popular uh, theme here and controversial, obviously. Um, yeah. But otherwise, I would like to say thank you very much, Laurie. Please stay online because we will have the panel discussion in the end and we'll keep minutes for that as well. We'll do yeah. Thank yes, you. I echo that. Thank you very much, Laurie. And I'll just encourage you to um, go online and, and watch her uh, presentation. It's really worth your while. Um, and now uh, we have maybe a slightly different view uh, from Professor Sanjay Sharma. And we're very lucky to have him to join us today. Um, professor Sharma is a professor of sports cardiology and inherited heart disease at St. George's University of London. Um, he may present a slightly different view because I've uh, watched his lecture and he's going to talk about uh, prevention um, in um, uh, of, um, cardiac arrest um, in sports, uh, related to sports. Thank you, Sanjay. Thank you very much. So thank you very much for um, inviting me. I'm going to be talking about preventing sudden cardiac death in athletes. The benefits of, cardi uh, of, of exercise on the cardiovascular system are very well established. However, it is recognized that exercise may predispose to myocardial infarction and fatal cardiac arrhythmias. If we look at uh, the largest autopsy series on sudden cardiac death from the United States, we find that the mean age of sudden death in young athletes aged under 35 is 18 years old. The male to female ratio is nine to one. When we look at ethnicities, black people are five times more predisposed than white people. And there are certain sports such as soccer and basketball with a dynamic start-stop nature that appear to increase risk. When we examine the causes of death in young people, these are due to a diverse spectrum of cardiovascular diseases that may be inherited congenital or acquired, but the cardiomyopathies and the ion channel diseases seem to be the leading causes across the Atlantic. The prevalence of disease varies depending on which population is studied and how the numerator and denominator is calculated. And this ranges from one in 15,000 to one in 100,000. When we look at the older population, that makes up around 94% of all community-based exercise-related deaths. These deaths usually occur in men aged between 40 and 60, and they're largely due to coronary artery disease. Now, although sudden death in sport is rare, most individuals that die lose decades of life from diseases that can be diagnosed during life, and for which there are multiple interventions to minimize that risk of sudden death. And therefore, there are several incentives to prevent these catastrophes. And these range from athlete education, where we teach people about the warning symptoms of cardiac diseases, the fact that they're genetic in young people. So if there is a family history of premature cardiovascular disease in their first degree relative, that should be a warning sign. We teach older athletes about risk factors for atherosclerosis. We discuss 
the, the dangers of performance enhance, enhancing agents. And being in this COVID-19 pandemic, we emphasize that it's not good to exercise during a febrile illness or during a lower respiratory tract infection. Active screening does take place in the US, in Canada, and in the United Kingdom and various other European countries. And the practice varies from one country to another. But in Europe, we screen with the 12 VDCG. Clearly, screening is not foolproof, and therefore we require the provision of um, early cardiopulmonary resuscitation and automated external defibrillators. I'd like to go through both of these two issues. Let's look at the outcomes of screening in 11,000 adolescent soccer players. You know, one, one may argue that it's not worth doing, but these are the outcomes. We need to know these answers. The incidence of sudden cardiac death in these screened soccer players was one in 14,800. That's three times greater than that that's ever been reported in the past. The prevalence of serious cardiac conditions in these individuals was one in 260. And that's the sort of figure that one should be using when they're looking at whether we should be screening these individuals or not. The ECG, which is the cheapest tool in cardiology, was the most effective method of identifying serious diseases and identified 86% of the 42 athletes diagnosed with serious conditions. 75% of those diagnosed with a serious condition could be treated and returned to play. Now here is the snag. Screening identified only two of the eight athletes who died during the 11 year period of follow-up. And those deaths were predominantly from cardiomalthy. However, they occurred at a mean of seven years after screening, informing us that what is not there at the age of 16, i.e. a cardiomalthy, may be rampant by the age of 23 or 24. And this also means that ECG screening will not identify incomplete expressions, and therefore we do need other methods of preventing sudden death, such as automated external defibrillators. And this is particularly true for community-based rather than elite screening. Here is a bar chart of exercise-related sudden cardiac deaths in France, all comers. The orange bars in, uh, include the elite young sports people. They make up only 6% of all deaths, exercise-related deaths in the community. The vast majority of deaths occur in recreational runners, usually males aged between 40 and 60. So we do need other measures. And we know for a fact that a, a, a sport-based, or shall I say a community, when we have a cardiac arrest in the community, the outcome is much, much better during a, a sporting event than it is in general. Here is data from um, stats based on 11 million marathon runners, where the survival rate from a sudden cardiac arrest was 29%. If we look at the sort of people that survive, the survivors 100% got CPR versus only 40% of those that died. The time for a defibrillator to arrive was much, much shorter, 3.3 minutes in survivors versus 7.7 .7 minutes in those that died. And as a result of that, the initial rhythm at arrival was much, much more favorable in those that survived, ventricular fibrillation, versus those that died where the predominant uh, um, rhythm was either asystole or pulseless electrical activity. Now that sounds very good and it's very pro defibrillators and I am very pro defibrillators, but look at this data here. If we look at the deaths with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, no one that died from hypertrophic cardiomyopathy survived, suggesting that there may be room to identify these people well, uh, early before their arrest because Cardiac arrest doesn't seem to do well, uh, or doesn't seem to uh, um, get good results in people with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Most of these people had pulseless electrical activity. However, there is good data from American schools. This is data based on 1,710 American schools, uh, where they looked at survival of cardiac arrests amongst pupils and teachers, and they found that a cardiac arrest in an American school was associated with a successful outcome in 64% of cases. In those schools, particularly who had a good emergency response plan, 
that consisted of good personnel, an excellent communication system, where everybody knew where the AEDs were placed and knew that they were serviced, and those people also practiced the emergency response plan on a regular basis. And to have good success, the mean time to start resuscitation from collapse was 1.5 minutes, and the mean time to ap apply the defibrillator to the chest wall was 3.6 minutes. So in summary, sudden cardiac death in athletes is relatively rare. However, the risk in these individuals uh, can be reduced by athlete education in young and old athletes, by active cardiac screening in young athletes, and by the availability of rapid cardiopulmonary resuscitation in both young and old athletes. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sanjay. That was a, a really good summary of your talk. Um, again, I encourage everyone um, who's find this interesting to, to watch Sanjay's talk on, online and also post any questions that you might have um, in the Slido Q&A uh, for us um, so we can answer them. Um, there's also going to be a poll to, uh, for us to find out what you think about um, uh, screening in young athletes. So I'm going to start by asking a question. I'm really interested in the way you described the emergency response plan that was um, that's been practiced in the US schools. Um, and in UK, there's been a very strong campaign to get children educated in CPR in school. Um, and um, that's now been a policy to has been adopted. Do you think we should go a bit further and actually not just train them in CPR, but actually do a, a program where um, they can practice if an emergency happens so that um, it's not just about the skills, but they can actually apply the skills in scenarios and keep them keep the skills topped up? Well, I think the most important thing is to make sure that they can do effective CPR. And there are very effective mannequins that uh, can be used at schools to practice this sort of thing. And I think everyone should be encouraged to be able to do this. Uh, I think the situation when it comes to actually uh, doing an emergency response plan may be a little bit more complex, but certainly something that should be entertained. But when we come to British schools, I think what, something that I would really be pushing for is that all schools should have at least three or four defibrillators. And that's what we should be gunning for. This should be routine practice that all schools where they perform physical training and people are pushed uh, to exercise, you don't really know which one of those young individuals, which one of those one in 300 individuals may have something wrong with them and may collapse. And I think that's the situation what we should be, that, that's what we should be going for, i.e. training young people to do CPR, but also having AEDs in schools. Right. So thank you very much for that. We're getting quite a few comments um, coming through. So keep those questions coming. Um, coming. Um, I'm interested in you saying about um, having two or three AEDs. Where would you strategically place them if you um, had three? Is it just in the sports area or does it, should it be um, based on distance and maybe where uh, most children gather? Hmm. Good point. Uh, I'm well, obviously, if we look at the risk, I mean, obviously, this is not going to apply to school children because they're unlikely to have a myocardial infarction. But your risk of a sudden cardiac arrest is 17-fold greater during exercise than at any time. So it's probably practical to have these in areas where there is physical training or sports training. But what's required is a very effective communication system whereby if there is a cardiac arrest elsewhere in the school, uh, the person or personnel responsible for the defibrillator can get to that area very quickly. Yeah, um, actually, I, I was also thinking is that um, we also need to think about the adults, the teachers who who might also suffer um, uh, sudden cardiac arrest as well. So we should um, also pay attention to them that, that the AED, wherever we place them, has to be quickly accessible and can be taken to wherever the emergency might be. Exactly, um, yes. Yeah. Freddie, did you want to have a look at some of the questions that have come in um, on the Q&A? Yeah, it's, it seems that there are a lot of comments and they actually support what you were saying about AEDs and teaching school children there. Uh, yes, uh, Saul has a question. Any tips for those of, of us about <coughs> 50 uh, who wants to exercise more high intensity? I think yes, it's nice I'll, to keep, do so. 
I will keep this brief. Clearly, the, the, the one thing that we worry about in people in their 50s is, is silent atherosclerotic coronary artery disease. And it's not very easy to identify those people uh, because the ECG will not identify people with uh, silent atherosclerotic coronary artery disease. And many of these people with non-obstructive coronary artery disease will have a negative exercise stress test. So the 2020 guidelines in sports cardiology have adapted a very adopt a very practical approach whereby we use the score, score system, the systemic coronary risk estimation that relies on a combination of use of tobacco, blood pressure, and cholesterol. And those people that have a score of 5% or more over the next 10 years are the sort of people that should probably be assessed with a minimum of an exercise stress test before they go from sedentary to high intensity. However, if they've got no symptoms and they're going from sedentary to low and moderate intensity, then there is no need for cardiovascular assessment in asymptomatic people with low risk. It also seems that a lot of the questions and comments uh, coming up right now is, 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 is deviating a bit away from exercise and preventing that and to preventing uh, cardiac arrest in schools and also addressing the issue that it's not often children having cardiac arrest, but it's the teachers and visitors, and, and then about strategic uh, placement of AEDs there. As I understand it, UK just got a law saying you should teach CPR in school for the future, right? That's but do you have any recommendations on uh, <coughs> placing AEDs in schools? You recommend it, but it's not by law in the UK, is it? No, I think you, what you do find certainly in some of the privately funded schools, uh, there, are, there is a very strong incentive, especially in sporting schools, to have defibrillators. But I think these sort of, sh this should be available everywhere, not just in privately funded schools. And in my opinion, <clears throat> AD placed in schools is also kind of making awareness of cardiac arrest as a public health issue. And people will ask, what is it used for? And they will be, be better prepared when it happens. So it's not just for the schools, but it's in general education. Yeah. Yeah, I think that uh, any other questions? Um, well, it's a really lively audience we have, so, so it's difficult to pick up and find out and time is running, but maybe we can do that in the <coughs> end, find some of the questions. But the good thing is that it seems that the audience are interacting with each other, giving answers and questions and comments uh, to their uh, questions. So this is the way it should be. That's really good. So maybe we should uh, thank you, Sanjay, for your presentation on prevention and uh, go to the next speaker. Thank you very much. And the next speaker is uh, David Seidemann, and he's going to talk about uh, the field of play. Um, we just heard that that you cannot prevent everything. And when it happens, you need to have a, a, play, a, a system in place to save lives. Uh, David is well known to most of us. I think he's a founding member of the uh, Resuscitation Council in UK, the ERC and ILCO member. Uh, and he is also the honorary physician to the Queen. And he has been awarded the prestigious award in Royal Victorian Order. Um, and then he's a member of the International uh, Olympic Committee on Medical and Science Games Group. And, and I think, David, you are the person who has attended most uh, Olympic Games uh, as a medical person. And that is, uh, so you're a real expert in that area and you are going to tell us about, and you're also a team player yourself, and you are going to teach us about uh, resuscitation on the field of play, please, David. Uh, thank you, Freddie. Uh, and uh, good afternoon, everybody, or good morning, depending on where you are in the world. Uh, great pleasure to be here. And uh, uh, thank you very much, Laurie and Sanjay. Uh, it's great to have the numbers and the figures uh, and to have some real science behind all of this. Um, I'm going to be, because this is towards the end of the conference, um, I thought uh, I would uh, take you away from the numbers game a little bit and tell you a little bit about the practical aspects and what you should be thinking about. And in many ways, what Laurie and Sanjay have already said, supporting uh, what they've said with some real practical considerations. So what I'd like to do is uh, go through this uh, motion of sharing my screen. Um, 
and hopefully that has worked. It's going to full screen. Um, and I'm going to talk to you about how we do resuscitation uh, on the field of play. Um, it was a great pleasure to produce a, a talk for you. And I started that with a real time example of, um, uh, of a football or soccer uh, incident in 2012. That incident occurred in March 2012. Uh, it was um, it was it really changed things because it was six months or five months before the Olympic Games in London. It occurred in London. Uh, and it occurred five months before we started. And immediately it happened within an hour. Uh, I was getting phone calls because I was in charge of emergency medical services for the London Olympics as to whether or what we would do and how we would actually deal with this. Uh, we actually had a plan in place. Uh, it was a plan we uh, derived over time uh, and from quite a lot of experience and even working uh, uh, over some time with Sanjay in the past, basically on marathon runs. Um, and um, we actually came up with a plan which we've actually shared now and has worked. And it's very, very similar to what happened uh, at that Tottenham football match. So let's let me uh, just summarize uh, my lecture very quickly and run through some of the, what I think are the, the key features, basically. Um, I think the most important thing is that if you are uh, a medical officer at a sporting event, whether it be a high powered elite sporting event or whether you're just covering your uh, son or daughter's uh, football match or, or whatever, basically, um, and you're expected to be the medical officer or you're expected to provide a medical service, you should look at it very, very carefully. You should plan what you are gonna do. You should do a risk assessment in, in relation to what type of sport it is, what the risks are in terms of, uh, of injury and illness and cardiac arrest. Uh, I think people tend to ignore cardiac arrest because it's a thing that they hope will never happen in front of them. If you are dealing with a, a, a bigger event, basically you need a field of play medical team and that team needs to be very carefully picked uh, it needs to have the relevant skill base. It needs to understand what they're doing. Uh, it needs leadership. And, to, and also, most importantly, it needs to be trained. And as a team, uh, it needs to be trained as to what to do, how they're going to approach a situation, uh, and how they're actually going to go um, onto the field of play and, and what each of them are going to do. And I'm going to come back to that in a moment. The second part of this is implementation. So having done your planning, uh, you need to actually go ahead and implement it. Your field of play team should be fully equipped with what they need. And that must, uh, and I, I can't emphasize that enough, that must include nowadays uh, some form of AED or defibrillator. Uh, and at least one, if not more, of the field of play team, the medical team should know how to use it. Um, it is amazing how many international federations, even an elite sport, and even lower down uh, in, in national sport, they still do not insist on having defibrillators uh, available. Uh, and I fully go along with uh, what um, has been said already about having these in schools, uh, something which is very, very important. So one of the first things is, about implementation is somebody goes down, it's, an un, uh, it's a witness to cardiac arrest. You don't know it's a cardiac arrest. You just see somebody collapse on the field of play, basically, probably not in contact with anybody else. Uh, they just uh, slide to the floor. The first thing is, is it's safe to access the field of play? It's not quite as simple as it seems. So in games like rugby, uh, the medical team can access the field of play at any time. And for those of you who are keen on rugby, you've probably seen how sometimes that medical team gets involved uh, with, with the actual game as the game progresses. In other sports, uh, if, the field of, if the medical team entered the field of play, uh, all the athletes or that game is actually disqualified. And certainly in individual sports, such as fencing, uh, um, where it's not safe to enter the field of play, obviously, while the competition is still on, uh, if you enter the field of play, both athletes are automatically disqualified. So you have to understand the rules of the game. It may sound obvious for the next one, start CPR, but it is not quite as obvious to some people. It is interesting how many people have said to me, well, if somebody collapses on the field of play in a cardiac arrest, uh, we'll go on and we'll immediately remove them. And I, my comment will be, why don't you do something? Why don't you start CPR, start chest compressions, defibrillate the patient? And the comment is, well, we're on the field of play. 
And it is my view that resuscitation should start uh, immediately, as soon this is a witness cardiac arrest, and as Sanjay uh, and, and uh, everybody's just said, basically, uh, this is the one time where you're going to have a good result if you start your resuscitation very early on. So I believe that uh, accessing the field of play, uh, when the team get on there, they should have roles, they should have an airway role, a breathing, circulation, drugs, whichever way you want to do it, it should be matched to their skill set. Somebody should bring a defibrillator on, it should be placed on the patient, and effectively, uh, they should be defibrillating that patient as soon as possible, just as they should start chest compressions as quickly as possible as well. So having started your CPR, you're now uh, beginning CPR, and I'm going to present you with the big scenario. So you are, uh, and I'm not specifically talking about Olympics, but you are in front of 80,000 people in a stadium. Uh, basically, you have 10 million people watching you on television. You are doing excellent cardiopulmonary resuscitation. Uh, according to the ERC and ILCOR guidelines, you defibrillated the patient. And then what? How long do you continue for? Have you got a plan for this? Do you know what to do? Uh, this is a big question. You, you, know, you can't sit there uh, until you make a decision that this patient is not going to survive. And, and then what do you do? Uh, you can't just um, run away, basically. Uh, you're in a live situation. It's not like being in hospital where you can draw a screen around yourself and say, right, we're going to go on for another five minutes and then if everybody agrees, we'll stop. So how long is a real question? Uh, we came up with a number of solutions. We looked at, would you leave the field of play or would you try and leave after about three shocks? Um, when the effectiveness of the initial shocks basically is beginning to drop, or do you stay until, for example, at that time, the ambulance service uh, was doing 18 shocks and then saying they weren't willing to go on any further? Uh, from my point of view, we've actually come out with a, uh, a recommendation of three shocks. Um, we felt that that's probably five to six minutes into the resus event. By that time, uh, things should be settling down a little bit. The um, ambulance service, uh, the ambulance could be notified and um, the, you can actually get, uh, you should be able to get your uh, scoop stretcher onto the field of play. And within six minutes, you should have that patient loaded onto the, uh, onto the uh, stretcher, basically, onto the scoop. Having got them loaded and you've decided to move, where do you go? Um, my recommendation of what we've practiced with our teams, and we really do practice this over and over and over again with them, uh, every time before every game, uh, in every scenario, basically, uh, is initially we go to a sideline or we go, it, we move uh, far enough that uh, for about 15 or 20 seconds, we'll stop CPR unless we've got a chest compression device on. Uh, we'll stop CPR, move to the sideline, continue CPR, and then uh, give another shock. Having done that, we can then move again from the sideline to the tunnel, or we can move uh, to directly, but we're moving towards, and I would actually say, I wouldn't go to the medical room. This is not a place. Uh, this is not the event for a medical room. This is, needs to go into the back of an ambulance and basically be moving towards hospital and definitive care as soon as possible. It's a principle of pre-hospital life support. Uh, and I think these people will need to actually be moved very quickly and very effectively, especially to witness cardiac arrest uh, towards definitive care. So that gets you out of the stadium and we continue uh, resuscitation until we get to hospital. Um, do you pronounce life extinct on the field of play? Um, my own feeling is that is not the place to pronounce life extinct unless kind of it's not um, the standard uh, cardiac event as we're talking here now, unless it's an obvious um, uh, death, basically the head is separate, separated from the body, for example, uh, very sad trauma events. But for these type of events, I would actually say they should never be uh, uh, pronounced life extinct uh, on the field of play. They should always be moved and they should be moved away into an ambulance and onto hospital. So that's trying to give you a few answers. And in summary, uh, what I'm trying to say to you all is if you are uh, performing resuscitation on the field of play, if you have a responsibility for it, um, I think that nowadays, uh, whether this is at a, a high level an elite sport or whether this is at school sport, or even if you are just uh, one of the doctors <clears throat> or nurses or physios or et cetera, whether you're a healthcare professional and you're 
you know, um, every Saturday, every Sunday morning football team basically rely on the fact that you're there and you've just got a first aid kit in the back of your car and hopefully a defibrillator, that you have planned a little bit more carefully. You do know that, for example, your telephone works where you are. Uh, you equip appropriately. You recruit where it's necessary extensively and get the right skill base. Having got that skill base, you do match it and you do use it selectively. If you've got an anaesthetist, use them to manage the airway. You've got a cardiologist like Sanjay, put him on the defibrillator. You can't have anybody better at pushing a button. And uh, then uh, you train them thoroughly with uh, repeated scenarios. And we repeat the scenarios not only uh, uh, every week, uh, we repeat them uh, every time the team meets so that that team uh, knows exactly what they're gonna do. And then you have to adapt critically to whatever the field of play, uh, whatever the sport, and what are the weather, et cetera, wh whatever conditions there are. So uh, thank you, um, Freddie. Uh, that I will finish there and I'll hand you back my screen. Thank you, David. Uh, very interesting. Um, and a lot of questions came up as well and also a poll going on right now. I just want to ask you one question and for, for, for starting off, uh, that would be, uh, what is the major difference between your resuscitation team uh, at the field of play compared to what's going on in EMS in the streets and, and, and resuscitation team in the emergency department? In your opinion, what's the difference? So, let me just take it between my team, the, the field of play team and the emergency department. That's the easiest. This is a pre-hospital cardiac arrest. So there is a huge difference. Uh, it's not a hospital event. Uh, we don't have everything available to us. Uh, we don't have an unlimited source of people being able to do chest compressions. Basically, it's very limited. Um, uh, we don't have necessarily all the drugs, all the defibrillators, all the electrical equipment. We can't do x-rays, etc. So you are you're very limited as to what you can actually do. You can only do what you've actually got with you. And then if you're talking about comparing that with an ordinary EMS event, so for example, a cardiac arrest on the street, this is the ultimate witnessed cardiac arrest. This is, um, so basically um, if, it, for example, an elite sport um, where, uh, and the Olympics, uh, if you've planned for this, uh, you should be able to deal with this very, very quickly. And um, I would hope, uh, and I think the others, and I hope you would agree, I would actually hope that uh, you would have a defibrillator on that patient who delivered the first shot within 30 seconds. You should be able to get there that quickly. I, I'm not talking about marathon running, uh, where they always seem, the marathon runners always seem to pick the furthest point in the most difficult access, basically, uh, for you to get to. And, um, uh, and that just uh, always seems to be most difficult, most of a problem. But uh, I think Sanjay's, in my experience with the London Marathon, and certainly Sanjay's experience more recently, is that he's been very effective at getting at some very good results in um, it, with the London Marathon and cardiac arrests. Um, but, you know, it's interesting you say all of this. Um, let me just put a, a, a point to you, and it makes you think about field of play. Um, so uh, one of my sports I'm responsible for is rowing uh, uh, and uh, British rowing, basically. Um, uh, rowing is, is particularly, it's not necessarily named on any of the risk sports, basically, uh, but uh, we had three cardiac deaths in 50-year-olds within six months in the same stretch of the river. Uh, that stretch of the river now, all the rowing clubs on that river have defibrillators, they, all the members of that, those clubs have been trained to use them. Um, and yes, it's, there'd always be the delay in getting the boat to the side and getting the person out, but people have been planning and, and trying uh, to actually uh, to, to work with that as well. They've had, out of those three, one of those three was successful. So it, it's really difficult, this, but a little bit of thought and a little bit of planning, it's quite amazing how far that will go. There's a question, uh, I think it was from Jazz asking, how do you prepare your team for CPR, uh, doing CPR in front of a live audience uh, and, and television? Is that part of the training or is it just the standard operating procedures on when to leave? So 
that I, I think the best way of doing this is that the teams are trained <clears throat> and trained so well. If they, everybody has their role, then it looks like a ballet. They go in, do the thing that they are best at. They know they can do this. If you practice them over and over again, they don't even think about the people around them. Uh, they just get on with it, basically. Uh, and it is a matter uh, uh, and, uh, you know, really, really of, of training these people. Uh, if you go, so for example, if you were at a, a rugby match this afternoon, I would have that field of play team out there before um, the, the game started. I would have them on the middle of the field of play. It doesn't even have to be a mannequin. They basically all have to, somebody collapses. We actually go out there, we do all the bits and pieces, et cetera. We know how to do the resuscitation. The people go into the correct position. So we know exactly what's going to happen. It works. The more you practice it, uh, the better you get at it. And the more routine it comes. And then people have confidence that the other people around them are doing what they expect them to do as well. So that's the way I would do it. I think that scenario practicing does work and it probably adds a little bit to actually just say, um, so I would expect my medical teams to arrive an hour before the game, at least an hour before the game start, because not only should they check their equipment, but they should also undergo a scenario practice uh, out in on the field of play, uh, out in the arena. Following up on that, there's another question <coughs> been asking, have you ever experienced, uh, and then he put in uh, in a professional setting, that a medical incident had been elected, had been neglected in favor of the competition? Uh, oh, this is really difficult. difficult <laughs> really difficult. Um, because there's a lot of questions being asked at the moment, even at um, <clears throat> elite level, about whether referees are trained to recognize medical events. Uh, and if you look at some of the horrendous uh, YouTube videos, you will see um, uh, basically it's often in, in team games, it's often not the referee or, or the assistant referees are, are notice it. It is actually the colleagues, the, the, the uh, team that recognize what's going on or, or um, the uh, or, or, or the other uh, training staff, basically. But I think this is getting better. I think referees are becoming much more uh, alert to uh, medical incidents. Most of the international federations now are insisting that they have, uh, that uh, medical, that referees have some basic first aid training. And I think what they have to do is, um, so this is part of the meet, this is part of the scenario training. Uh, if the referee goes out onto the pitch and sees the medical team out there doing a practice, then it reminds them and it gives them confidence that he should get them on quickly and then he can step back. I think what's more important is what the referee then does with the rest of the team, because the game's not going to continue um, during that uh, uh, resuscitation event. So he, it will possibly be better either to remove the teams uh, from the sporting arena, whatever they are doing, basically, uh, or uh, and and then a decision can be made as to whether they want to continue because this is this would be quite a, a serious, quite a difficult event, basically, for them to any of the teams uh, uh, either side, basically, uh, to be able to take in and then continue to perform. Great, thank you very much, David. A lot of questions and comments still come, coming up. I wonder, George, should we go to the final panel discussion with all of us and then summarize uh, some of the questions or have a discussion before you summarize and close the session because there's a closing session for the Congress afterwards? You are, you are unmuted. You're muted. Oh, fatal error. So, uh, yes, there's uh, going to be a closing ceremony, so we do need to be on time for that. So, um, uh, so I do have um, some uh, summary questions just to bring all our speakers in, just to see what you think. So listening to all your talks, and thank you so much for fascinating talks. Can I just ask um, all the three panel members whether they believe um, that we should be screening um, athletes regularly? Um, and if so, um, at what age and how regularly? Um, I'm going to go to Laurie first. You're also on mute, Laurie. Yes, you, you, you certainly know my answer. My data is right out there. So uh, we concluded that in our population in Canada that the screening wouldn't be helpful in out of possible cardiac arrest. In terms of prevention, there are lots of other reasons to screen, which Sanjay has summarized. Okay, thank you. What about Sanjay? 
Well, I'll have bound to have to disagree just to make this interesting. Um, I think there are lots of arguments why we should be screening these people. Um, firstly, that the incidence of diseases that actually cause sudden death, and this is well known, this is not just my literature, this is just not my paper, there are lots of papers that tell us that one in 300 young people, whether you look at them in the States, in Canada, or in the UK, have a cardiac condition that could potentially kill them. We know that. We know that that, that risk is increased uh, during exercise, and we know that 80% have no warning symptoms before they die. So if we're going to push our athletes, remember it's the job of our athletes to push themselves beyond their limits for club and country. If we're going to push them to this level, we have a responsibility of protecting them. I've already said before that hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, CPR in, on the streets doesn't help very much. It, the results are terrible. So prevention is sometimes better than trying to resuscitate. It's, it's worth identifying these people. Now, I'm not having a pop at Laurie in any way, but what I wanted to say was that some of what Laurie was presenting was old. You know, this data that 200 people have to be disqualified and so forth. We have made massive, massive um, headway with the way we interpret the athlete's ECG. Whereas the Italians were very, very conservative. They've changed their stance on the whole of this stuff as well. Most of this data that came from Benito, where they were disqualifying athletes left, right and center, that has changed. I can tell you now that the current international recommendations for ECG interpretation, an abnormal ECG has a positive predictive value of 17%. So if an athlete's got an abnormal ECG, there's a 17% chance that they've actually got something seriously wrong with them. So I think when we've got everything I've told you so far, and we've got a very cheap test that can actually make this diagnosis, we should be doing something. Laurie was also asking about the cost effectiveness of all of all this. Now, of course, the cost varies from North America to Europe, but let me give you the costs based on our UK system. We've done this on 25,000 all comers. There's a charity called Cardiac Risk and the Young that will test all comers. You don't have to be an athlete to be tested. And it's a non-profit making organization. So what they do is they do a health questionnaire and a 12 lead ECG. And just to make it very, very quick, anyone that needs further tests has them. And they, we did the calculation for how much it would cost to have all these tests done and risk stratify these people. And we worked out that it would cost around 52 pounds per person to run this sort of program based on NHS tariffs. Thank you very much. And I encourage everyone to watch the videos online. Um, and David, do you have a do you have a, a view on this? So so very quickly, because I know that time is very short, I'm just going to turn around and say that the international federations, uh, sports federations, if you are going, if you're proceeding up the, uh, 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 the scale of athletes, basically, and, and proceeding towards international sport or even national sport now, uh, they require you to be screened. Um, and in fact, if you, for example, if you go and try and run a marathon in France now, you have to produce a screening certificate. Um, so uh, even if it's not an elite sport, basically. So there is a lot more going on with screening. And I think it's, it is the key question um, uh, which needs to be answered still. But uh, again, thank you to both uh, Sanjay and Laurie for being so honest and open, uh, because I think it's, a, it's an interesting and ongoing discussion. Yes. So uh, thank you very much. Um, and it's been a real pleasure and we're very lucky to have a great panel. And we really enjoy that. So on behalf of Freddie and myself and all the people who are listening, um, a big thank you to the panel and, uh, and thank you for joining us for this uh, conference. Um, I'm going to leave you now with a couple of minutes before the closing ceremony. Um, thank you again and see you soon.